I'm with Dottie and we're gonna read chapter three in Who Was George Washington Carver? School Days. When George woke up the next morning, he stepped outside. The owner of the barn, Mariah Watkins, saw him. She figured he was hungry, so she fixed him some breakfast in the main house. What's your name? Maria asked him. Mariah asked him. I'm Carver's George, she said, he said. That sounded as if Carver owned George. Mrs. Watkins, who was black, didn't like that. Slavery had ended more than 10 years earlier and nobody owned anyone else. So Mrs. Watkins called him George Carver. George told Mrs. Watkins that he was in Neosho to go to school. He didn't have a place to live yet, but he'd figure something out. Mrs. Watkins was a kind woman, so she told George he could stay with her and her husband, Andrew. She, but she also was a strict, no-nonsense woman. If George was going to live there and go to the nearby Lincoln School, named after Abraham Lincoln, he'd have to do his share of, of the chores. George was delighted with that deal. He already could clean house and do laundry. Moses Carver had taught George not to waste anything. Now Mrs. Watkins taught him not to waste any time. She expected him to go to school during the day, but to come home at recess and do laundry. After school, he would clean the house and maybe help cook dinner. George and Mr. and Mrs. Watkins read the Bible during the week, and they went to church on Sundays. Sometimes George walked back to Diamond Grove to visit Moses and Susan and Jim on the weekends. Neosho was different than Diamond Grove. There were about 3,300 people living there, almost three times as many people as in Diamond Grove. And about one of every eight residents in Neosho was black. D Diamond Grove had only 16 black people living in the whole town when George grew up there. George stayed in Neosho for a year or so and learned just all he could at the one room Lincoln School. This simply sharpened my appetite for more knowledge, he wrote. He found that if he wanted more schooling, he'd have to move again and again and again. At the time, many former slaves were moving from the South into Kansas and other Northern states in search of a better life. In 1878, George hitched a ride with one such family on the way to Fort Scott, Kansas. George rode in the back of the wagon for part of the 80 mile trip and walked the rest of the way. In 1879, he moved to Olaf, Olaf Kansas. In 1880, he moved to Minneapolis, Kansas, and then to Paula, Kansas. Oh, maybe I should show you the picture. At each stop, George's agreeable personality and willingness to work hard made it easy for him to find a family to take him in. In Fort Scott, he moved in with Felix and Maddie Payne and their family. Felix was a blacksmith. In Olaf, George moved in with Cece and Lucy Seymour. George helped Mrs. Seymour with her laundry business. In time, he moved with their family to Minneapolis. In Paula, he moved in with Willis and Delilah Moore. These were all black families who lived in mostly white towns. 
In this period, sunshine and shadow were profusely intermingled. George wrote, in other words, they were both good times and bad times. The good times included finding schools in every town he lived. He never wanted to stop learning. One classmate remembered that George, who had grown to be six feet tall and thin, would rather collect plants and leaves at recess than play games. The bad times, however, included cruel encounters with racism. The worst of it came from Fort Scott, where George witnessed a lynching, a black man being murdered by a group of white men. As young as I was, the horror haunted me, he said. George left Fort Scott shortly after. Other instances involved George personally. In one town, he and a white friend went out to breakfast. When they sat down, the waiter told them he would serve the white man, but not George. This kind of racism was legal in those days under Jim Crow laws. In 1883, George got word that his brother Jim had died from smallpox. Jim was 23 years old. He had left the Carter farm a few years earlier and moved to Arkansas to find work. Although George had not seen his brother much after leaving home, he wrote that he felt as never before that I had left home. Now, a little blurb about history. Jim Crow laws. In 1865, the 13th Amendment officially ended slavery, but blacks in the United States, especially in the South, still suffered under Jim Crow laws. The laws were named after an offensive black character from a song in the 1800s. These laws kept blacks from using the same restaurants and hotels as whites did, and they allowed for separate but equal facilities, such as restrooms or drinking fountains. For blacks and whites, in reality, while faculties were separate, they usually weren't equal. Places reserved for blacks were often much worse than for whites. Some Jim Crow laws lasted until 100 years after the end of the American Civil War, a hundred years. In 1954, the U.S. Supreme Court ended separate schools for blacks and whites. In 1965, civil rights laws finally put an end to separate but equal. Now back to the story. George found comfort though in friends who cared about him. He moved back in with the Seymour family in Minneapolis. This is where George took his middle name. When he began getting mail intended for a different George Carver in town, he added the initial W to his name so the postman would tell the two men apart. A friend asked if the W stood for Washington. George thought that sounded good. So he became known from then on as George Washington Carver. Remember, he doesn't have a birth certificate because back then what we read is that they didn't keep good tracks of that. So he basically created his name, George Washington Carver. George opened a laundry business, washing and drying clothes for other people in Minneapolis and bought a small plot of land. Then he sold the land for a profit and moved to the larger town of Kansas City. He entered a school to learn shorthand and typewriting. He thought he might want to work on a telegraph office for a telegraph office, but he decided business school wasn't enough. George wanted to go to college. So he began writing to colleges he might attend. 